Welcome everyone to tonight's proceedings. We're both here in person at the Royal Society of Victoria in the Ellery Theatre and also online via our Zoom webinar and also live streamed via YouTube. So before we begin, we have to acknowledge that all of us here in Australia are located on the traditional land of the continent's first scientists, the many different First Nations people who belong to the diverse lands and waters of this remarkable region of our amazing planet. We're coming to you from Melbourne and Port Phillip, a region called Nam by the people of the Kulin Nation who have lived with this country for tens of thousands of years. We are specifically located on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, uh, never ceded, and I invite everyone in joining, who's joining us tonight um, either via Zoom and the webinar's chat function or via the YouTube comments section uh, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on your local country. And join me in paying respects to their elders past and present. And we like, likewise extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who've joined us at the meeting tonight. This, I obviously have a script and this next bit I'm really glad I have a script for because I think it's, it's really important that I say it right because I think it's a pretty solemn time right now. So we particularly extend our sincere sympathies to those Indigenous colleagues and communities currently observing a week of mourning following the outcome of our national referendum last weekend, for which the society currently has its Aboriginal flag at half-mast in respect at the request of the Uluru Dialogue. We acknowledge the suffering of many during this difficult and very confronting national moment and pledge our continuing commitment to the principles and process of reconciliation between First Peoples and our comparatively vast migrant population, those of us who hold a vanishingly small cultural legacy on this continent. We are delighted to have Dr. Marina Bano, a senior research scientist with CSIRO's Data61 Digital Research Network with us tonight to help us confront at least one small corner of the rapidly evolving field of artificial intelligence and its impact on our culture. Let me tell you a little bit about Marina before we start. Dr. Manira serves as a senior research scientist at CSIRO's Data61, focusing on projects related to responsible AI and promoting diversity and inclusion within the AI field. Her focus is on the intersection of computers and humans, specifically exploring ways to engineer technology to better serve people's needs. Manira graduated with a PhD in software engineering from the University of Technology, Sydney in 2015. Since then, she has held positions as a postdoctoral researcher at both UTS and RMIT University in Melbourne. Manira has authored nearly 50 articles in prestigious international journals and conferences within the software engineering field. Her passion and interest in the field of artificial intelligence and diversity and inclusion guide her research in socio-technical domains of software engineering that focus on human-centered technologies. As a superstar of STEM and a member of the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee for Science and Technology Australia, Manira is dedicated to breaking down societal barriers and reshaping attitudes towards scientists from diverse backgrounds. In 2019, she was awarded the title of Most Influential Asian Australian Under 40 as part of the Asian Australia Leadership Awards in recognition of her achievements. Uh, welcome, Manira. Please come up. So while I was reading that, I had a really hard time not going off script because I've just been chatting to Manira and I am so excited about the work that she does. So I also work in machine learning, but uh, you know, I come from a much more dry background than Manira, I think, and I just can't wait to hear about the side of AI, which I think is actually a much more challenging nut to crack than just the technical code and uh, the maths of the problem. So before you start, Manira, I have a question for you. We all hear about all of the things in our life that AI is going to transform or replace or can do better than we can, but I wanna know, what are some of the things that it won't do better than we can? We are humans and I think we will always be best at being humans compared to AI. That's a very um, so intriguing this is kind answer. Of because I, I don't want to go into the details because that's entirely my talk is all about. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we will always be human and we will be better at being human compared to AI. Well, I... 
feel very proud of myself for having segued into your talk so effectively. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to leave you to it. Thank you so much. So let me see. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for uh, the great introduction. I'm being humbled to be here. And uh, I was reminding Mike that last time when uh, I gave the talk, it was during the Melbourne lockdown, uh, lockdowns. I think it was in 2020 and October 2020. So it's almost three years ago. And I was really looking forward to coming to this room because the aura here is more like, you know, <laughs> uh, being in a science theater rather than just looking into those boxes on your screen, which at the same time, we are grateful that it, it was there during this pandemic to provide us with that connectivity that we wanted with each other. So yes, AI has been imp is impacting our lives in really, uh, I would say, beneficial ways to keep us connected. But at the same time, we have to be aware of what it is and what it is not. So today, my talk here is about reimagining humanity in the age of generative AI, uh, where I will be touching upon some of the work that we are doing in uh, CSIRS Data 61 within the diversity and inclusion in AI team. But before that, I wanted to go through some of the story of what makes us human. If we want to imagine humanity in the age of generative AI, we have to understand what exactly it would take us to declare ourselves that we, as a human, have difference compared to the things that AI can or cannot do, exactly what Catherine was asking me. So before starting the talk, let's start with a bit of intro with what is real. I am not Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? I'm not sure how many of you have come across this video on the internet before, but ever since this wave of generative AI, internet has been stormed by these videos where it's quite difficult to differentiate between what is real and what is fake. Sometimes they are so convincing that you actually think that it's real. And this is the time that we need to assess that when we say something is real, how do we know? How do we define that reality? So reality, in very simple terms, what we say is that it's the state of the things as they exist. There is subjective and objective reality where we can say that as a researcher, we talk about it, that maybe whatever we see, whatever we experience, all these experiences are built inside our mind. Or maybe there is a truth that is independent of anything that we feel or experience. We just may have a glimpse of part of it. So different philosophers have different kind of perception about it. Philosophically, there are lots of schools of thoughts who have defined what the reality would mean. How do we understand it? And then there are scientific point of views, that how do you understand, how do you collect the knowledge, the observation methods that would be accepted. As researchers, we have certain methods which are accepted by the scientific community. If we just come up with some opinions, they may not accept them, that this, may, this cannot be constituted as a real research. Then we have technology, the virtual reality, the cyberspace. Are they, they constitute a different kind of reality that, do, that exists alongside with our world. And then is, there is our everyday life, interaction with other people, environment, animals, which may or may not be documented or digitized for us to be recorded, but it exists. We may not know we are in particular point in time and space, we exist in one part of you know, the map, what's going on in other parts of the world. We may not know that, but that's everyday life that is happening. So exactly when we say we talk about reality, we all have a different version of the slice of it that we experience. 
and how it all starts, that it's a composite of our experiences, sensations, perceptions, and interpretations that are shaped by the human mind and our senses. And that is why we see so many differences. There's a diversity of thoughts when it comes to defining the same instance that two people will observe. They might come to a different kind of react. They might, they might come to a different kind of reaction or they describe it, may describe it in different terms. It's because we all perceive the reality in different way. So what the differences are coming from, it's all coming from our origin. We are in the same planet Earth, but our circumstances, where we are born, the culture, cultural backgrounds, where we are raised, there are so many factors that describe our experiences on how this will define for us. The second part of our defining our reality is the memories. What do we remember? As human, we remember some stuff, we forget other. And if our memories are taken away from us, what would the reality be then? Would there ever be existence or consciousness that would remain there? So memories, they constitute a big part of what we call as reality, what we remember. How do we identify with the world? And then languages, of course. The words we speak, the way we understand the world, the way we interact with other people, how other people, the words, how they invoke certain emotions in us. It all kind of, you know, create a different kind of reality. So the languages that we speak, they also impact the way we, would, we are going to perceive the reality. What would be real for us would be we understand. If someone is speaking in a language that does not make sense to me, I may hear it, but it will not make any sense and it will not be part of my memory or my experiences. So that understanding, we as a human, we are dependent on these languages. These symbols, these words, pictures, all of these documented evidences, later on they become part of data. That data is the building block of reality. So we humans, we have these senses to get this data, we interact with the environment to understand and create a version of reality. We transfer a small portion of that reality to a digital world. And that reality then becomes something that AI will learn from. This is something that we are going to go through in these slides to understand how this transformation takes place. Now, as a human, we are dependent to get the data from our five senses. But our five senses, they have limited coverage of reality. There is a certain range of light that we can see through. There is a range of uh, voices that are beyond which we cannot hear. So there is an unknown, unknown part of the world that exists out there, which is beyond our senses. Then our memory, we do forget. We, have, we get distracted, and we have inherent biases based on our experiences. Uh, bad emotional traumas of the past, they do impact our future decisions in certain similar circumstances. And then when it comes to taking decisions or actions, even though as human beings we are told or we understand something is right or wrong, not necessarily the right is the path that we take. Human beings are complex beings. So the reality, even if the data is limited coverage, we have, I would say, not perfect memory and our decisions are imperfect. So how much of the reality that we absorb and how much of the world around us we understand and how much of that understanding we share with each other when we say that we share the same reality? Now, this is after our reality, when we try to create a computing system, a robot or an artificial intelligence system, we humans are the one to create it. We humans are the one to tell it what to do, how to learn. So we, first of all, it's the same simulation or I would say mimicking of the human understanding of reality. So the first part is always the data, that how is it going to understand or interact with the environment? The second is that it needs to store that information somewhere and it needs a processor to make decisions based on the data that it's stored. And then there might be, if it's a robot, there will be a mechanical structure to take actions or if it's, you know, certain other devices like, you know, voice recognition system or it can generate uh, some textual reports like LLMs. 
Now, once again, the data comes from environment and humans. Already we know that we humans have limitations. How can we provide a complete understanding of the data to the system? So it will, there will be a limitations to that data as well. When it comes to the processing and the memory, we human, we write the code, we make the rules. And the actions, of course, they are dependent on the rules that we provide to the program. Now this middle part where actually the artificial intelligence will reside about the memory and the processing power that it, we are humans are going to design it. So what enters into this artificial intelligence, that is what we are going to get on the other side as well. As much as the data is going to be incomplete, of low quality, corrupt, biased, you cannot expect the decisions on the other side to be of a different nature. Same with the human beings. We have a very different way of learning, and we haven't understood the human mind completely. I will be touching upon the topic of consciousness and other aspects of human mind that yet have not been simulated. So our decisions are much more complicated, and same way the AI, in some cases, we are now moving towards the push for explainable AI, for transparency in the system, that we want to know that how these AIs are making those decisions. We yet, as a human, have not been that transparent about our decision-making systems. We, why do we make wrong decisions then, even knowing that what was the right path? There are circumstances where we cannot justify them. It's just because there was some intuition or desire or some other aspect or emotion that we don't know how to program it into the machine yet. Then we have this way of transforming the raw data into intelligence, which is close enough of uh, a concept taken to the wisdom. Data itself is nothing. It's just numbers, characters, symbols. When you provide a context to it, that will become an information. And that information, once given a meaning, that will become wisdom, that will provide insights. That's where the level of intelligence comes. So there is a lot of processing that happens from data all the way, all the way towards creating an intelligence. But what do we know if we just want to stop at the level of knowledge? We have known knowns, which is a current knowledge, which we might share with each other and agree upon that these are the facts that we all know. Then we have known unknowns. We make assumptions about certain things that, you know, we all know gravity exists, how it works, you know, how the environment works. There are so many things that we yet, we might have theories about it, but we may not have the conclusive answers. Then we have unknown knowns. We do certain things, we don't know why we do it. We have unconscious biases is one of the examples of it. And then there are some surprises, unknown, unknown. There are so many mysteries in this world that we yet don't know. And the same is about our mind and our decision-making processes and as well as how we behave in certain circumstances. We don't know of our true strengths or true talents if we are not put into a certain trials. And till then, we don't know truly about ourselves. So saying that we know as a human who we are, we don't know a lot about ourselves, let alone that we can be, uh, be in a position to define the reality or try to code it for the machine. Now, at the same time, talking about data movie, there is now this social media provided a complete new perspective about it. And how much of this data at the moment you can see here is generated and uploaded to different apps and that gets stored because for large language models and generative AI, internet data is the main source for learning. And how many of us use these apps of how many times a day? Who are the people who are using it? Who are the people who are generating these contents? How much of that your reality or your self is being poured into it? How much you're contributing? So this reality from which these generative AI models are going to learn who is represented there and who is not represented there? That's the real question. When we talk about the diversity and inclusion initiatives, it's about the representation, that these algorithms are going to make decisions if they are going to be adopted by different businesses into their decision-making models. Who will be the people who will not be represented there? Of course, who will not be the part of the initial training set data? 
and we are going to dig a bit deeper into what that means. Now, this big data is the field that aims to analyze, systematically extract information from otherwise that data which is too hard and complex to deal with because of volume, variety, and velocity. So we see that now that the amount of data is exponentially going beyond the reach. We, without AI, it's not possible to analyze it into a meaningful form. And of course, generative AI is another one that learns from it and then create outputs based on it. So internet data is at the moment the cheapest easily available source of information from which we are making these algorithms learn new things. So there are two ways from which the data is come. One is the historical perspective from you know, history, that historical records are all there. And one is the social media. But if we talk about just the historical data, it's kind of, if you think about it, it's full of racism, sexism, and you know, religiously targeted violence. There have been wars, there was slavery, there was, uh, and one more example, there, were, there are data gaps. History was written by the victors. So who would verify the accounts of those who were, not, who were not important enough or who were not you know, victorious enough to make it to those documents? And the biggest of that is the gender data gap. Yeah. Women were excluded from a huge part of the history. Their accomplishments were not considered important enough to be included there. Um, I don't know how many of you have watched The Handmaid's Tale where there's a fictional utopian, you know, dystopian environment where the women are stripped of their rights. But how many of you know that there exists a part of the world where at the moment there are women who are living that fiction as a reality? And I'm not talking about the digital records, I'm talking about simple things in manually. Like in certain parts of Afghanistan and northern Pakistan, there women's names are not even allowed, allowed to be written on their tombstone because it dishonors the men in the family. So what happens to their names? Do they exist? What about their realities? They are not part of any of the data-oriented societies. And the term I have created, I know it's a bit of exaggeration, but I call it digital genocide of underrepresented groups. They will, they will never be, just like in history, there were other gen data gaps where people were excluded, they don't exist. This is going to happen in the future when the, it will be entirely a digital society. In the data-oriented societies, those people who do not have access because of their socioeconomical status or gender roles that were imposed on them by the society, once again, they will not be existing. Now, the biases in data, <clears throat> there have been so many examples that we see that what happens, we see as an outcome in the behavior of those products. So there have been reports initially when, uh, I think a few years ago, this was in the New Scientist, that two thirds of the female owners of Alexa said that the product was not responding correctly to their voices. So what would be the problem? It will not have in its training data set enough of the voices of the women or those of people with different accents. Then there were reports about when putting AI to judge a beauty contest, it would not you know, uh, prefer people with the darker skin. If AI is being trained on a certain stereotypical pictures, it's just like a child. You just showed it one particular sample of things. It cannot create things of its own. As humans, to you and me, this may look very beautiful because we have a very different perception. We don't understand how we appreciate beauty. But when you are going to code it into a machine, and we know the rules of how you're training an algorithm with the data, it may not be able to see the true beauty of this, because that is not how machines will appreciate the beauty. There was a time that Google image identification had to drop the uh, labeling of gorillas because of its extremely racist kind of behavior that it started showing on the Google image labeling. And they couldn't solve it and they just dropped the labeling altogether for that word. So usually, so this is another example of the exclusion in the data. So you can see here, I am talking about now the large language models because they are the one that takes all the data from the internet. 
roughly half of the world's population do not have access to internet. So that's the first level of inclusion, uh, sorry, exclusion. And then there, are, there is a silent majority who just content you know, consumers. They just open the social media, they read some stuff, they don't post that much. And then there is a, I call them nice, noisy minority, who are all the time typing or you know, commenting on this and that. So they are the ones who are actually contributing to this digital future, or that will be the history you know, created in the digital world. And within those content generators, there's a dominant global north. So that there's another level of exclusion that comes here. Within that, English is the dominant language. And just take that English from the global north, the dominant language, there is hate speech, there is low quality content, there's misinformation, there is sub a lot of useless stuff out there. And this is what is taken and scraped off the internet and fed into the algorithm. So once again, is that the reality? How many exclusions we saw on every step of it? Next is the work processes. So there was a research paper that I was uh, reading a while ago. It talks about the businesses and the corporations who promote ethical practices. But you have to look deeply into their internal work processes, how they treat their employees, how they have the ethical responsibility towards the people, humans. They may spend money on their you know, diversity inclusion initiatives, but their actual practices within the organization will reflect the actual intentions. So if there is something that you see, whether those products have to be used, whether you would like to use their system, whether you would like to pay for the subscription to contribute to their money, which they are not gonna pay to their employee, they will outsource it say, to other parts of the world, who will label that data for them at the lowest minimal cost possible. So the business practices also define that ethical boundary of how those processes are working, how those AI algorithms are getting trained, who are the people who are labeling them, and how are those people being treated who are labeling them. In the end, the people are the center of all of this. Is AI making them treat the people badly? No, it's the people themselves making decisions about other people. So, the next biases in the processes, one of the examples that came a few years ago was about the driverless cars. Once again, the training data set at that time was identified to not have taken into account people with the darker skins, uh, considering that the cars may not identify them as humans if they are the, uh, you know, passed by the pedestrians. So the ethical dilemma here takes further uh, different dimension in case of collision, who is responsible? Algorithm, the software, the programmer, the company, or the no one? How would you identify who was at the fault? So these are the additional problems that within the process of uh, you know, giving AI the decision-making power comes into being. And if it is the case, uh, let's say that was a probability calculated, but if it happens that the car did not consider a person with a darker skin as a human and hit that person, Whose fault will that be? Was it a pre-calculated racist murder designed by the programmers and the company didn't you know, look into the matter? Or would that be just taken an accident by the car or the natural instinct just like in any other scenario? Of course, these are thought experiments, but these are the challenges that will be faced once these driverless cars become a normal day occurrence on the road. So last year, after the chat GPT made it to the news, uh, for the first time, the large language models became the focus of uh, the mainstream media. So many article after articles were published in that short span of time. You would have seen a lot of headings that were talking about the doom and gloom that they are going to bring to the society, the jobs that will be taken over. And there was quite a sensation that was created around the launch of this chat GPT. But there were some of them that were true, that people could see that what the potential threats were there. It's about the use. The chat GPT, the language models were already there. Chat GPT was a new version of it, the 3.5 and now the 4. We as humans, how we want to use a tool, that's the problem. And chat GPT was provided to the masses for free. Millions of people in just closer to the launch, you know, became subscriber to it. So once it's 
power is provided to large masses, how they use it, that's going to be a problem because the good or bad generates from us, from our decision making. ChatGPT is there just to serve the prompts that we are going to feed into it. If I'm going to ask it to write an essay for me that I can submit to my teacher, it will do it. But should I, I do it as a student, the morality and the ethics of my decision lies on me. Now, after data and processes, the next is the intelligence itself. The word artificial intelligence is a bit controversial in the philosophical terms that how do we define intelligence to begin with? So for humans, the context, in the context of psychology, the intelligence is typically measured via IQ tests, which are designed to assess human intelligence in terms of logical reasoning, word comprehension, and problem solving skills. So there is a set metrics that how would you measure some person or some algorithm is intelligent or not. And in the field of AI, intelligence is commonly defined as the capability of a machine or a system to mimic or simulate certain aspects of human intelligence, including learning from experiences, understanding complex concepts, applying knowledge to manipulate the environment, or demonstrating cognitive functions like problem solving or decision making. So there are certain words that you will see here time and time again, which are about logical reasoning. <laughs> So mostly this comes from the Western philosophy of how they define intelligence. So this idea of scientific method, scientific inquiry, where you, pick up, you, you know, collect the data, you have to go through certain steps, which are called the you know, your reasoning process, and then you come to the results. <clears throat> but there are so many philosophies in other cultures, and they had the form of intelligence as well. Not to go too far away, just talk about our own land here in Australia, the First Nation people, they had the deep understanding and respect for the land, lore, and kinship systems. Wisdom transmitted through dreamtime stories, promoting custodianship and respect for the earth and community. AI does not include that definition. There is an exclusion right there. And then we talk about the Chinese philosophy. They do not define the wisdom or the intelligence in the same way as the Western philosophy. The Indian philosophy, Persian, Arabic, African. So what about what happens to this diversity of the thoughts and ideas? So we just took a slice of the definition of intelligence and coded it to you know, turn it into an algorithm and now we're calling it artificial intelligence and we want it to apply it to the rest of the world. What is the term used for, you know, not respecting other cultures, ideas, or understanding. We call it colonization. So this form of AI may be the tool of colonization where you're not respecting everything else that is out there, how they define intelligence, what their ideas are, and just putting one you know, definition to everyone should accept that. And then, of course, we did talk about our knowledge limitations. There are unknown unknowns. We don't know a lot about intelligence, how human mind works. And this was just about where we have words, pictures, voices, and that kind of data. That is what we are used to of seeing. But what about there is entire universe out there that is the world of silence? They are not dependent on language. They are not dependent on pictures and they do operate, they coexist. There is a balance that you see there. So when we talk about the definition of intelligence, we are only talking about the data that is available to us, whether, whichever form it is, whether it's on internet or not, but there is a complete balance in the entire ecosystem, the solar system outside, and they don't need the words to communicate with each other. So when we talk about the unknown unknowns and we are not including in our definition of intelligence this entire scenario here. And this is just one I could fit into the one slide. There's so much more out there which is silent but intelligent. So intelligence is not only dependent on the languages and words and symbols here. Now the next thing is what makes us human is our idea of consciousness. We know we exist. How do we know we exist? There are certain you know, theories about, of consciousness. Uh, there's one about dualism, where we can distinct with our mind and body, physicalism, but 
recently there have been some you know reports and ideas about AI becoming conscious and once it become conscious what will that mean for humanity um, I think what uh, one of that incident reported meant was that the AI algorithm was fearing for its existence and I think that fear of existence was mimicking of what we humans say we don't want to die or we fear what will happen after we die or the uncertainties of life after death so it can mimic that but does it actually understand what it means to not exist I don't think so because the problem will be that subjectivity how are we going to code that into algorithm how are we going to make it understand the ethical and moral quandaries the lack of the experiential learning and that's actually the part because these AI algorithms that are heavily dependent on data and for us human the data has a linear timestamp on it everything that has happened 10 years ago has a different meaning to us something that happened yesterday but for AI that timestamp has a has does not have the same kind of experiential meaning as it has for us as humans and then the absence of self driven goals AI lacks that intrinsic intrinsic desire of aspiration that is fundamental of human consciousness uh, there has been occasion I have been playing around with ChatGPT to make it ask me question I keep telling it to you know what do you want to know because it always tells me is there anything I can help you with I always respond is there anything I can help you with <laughs> and it keeps saying that I'm here to serve your command <laughs> so how there is no desire for it to learn or to ask from me that I have an experience I have certain background I may have certain knowledge but does ChatGPT even want to know who I am who is the person giving the command no so those desire exist with us we as a human we want to know other people we are we ask question who you are what you have done the same kind of desires may or may not exist there at this point in time now the million dollar question which at the time when this wave of generative AI was launched and a lot of people the real question I mean they had other questions but this was one of the top questions that was asked is it going to take over our jobs how is this going to transform the job market what will happen to us how many people will get redundant so power of generative AI yes it is there is a disruption it has created disruption to those tasks that could be automated that where companies or the organizations they could see they could save some dollars there they got rid of people they automated the job AI did not took their job your boss fired you and they automated your job the humans made the decision to take away your job and make an algorithm work uh, instead of you so no AI is not taking your job <laughs> your boss is the power of generative AI if you think about it there are certain industries where yes it has disrupted there has been you know you will see contents after contents that are pictures and images and I show you in the beginning a video of uh, an actor whose face was taken and you know a new video was created which was not actually the actor themselves it was a deep fake generated by someone and the face was simulated on it and there has been you know certain uh, movies which uh, I think this is one of the examples where a news anchor uh, is AI simulated so you don't have to put up with their attitude you can just feed the script into the news anchor and they will read it for you and then there have been some really convincing pictures of Pope on the internet that really people thought that they were actual so it's becoming very difficult to see what's real and what's fake and then there was a black mirror episode of Joanne is awful where actually the actors actresses faces were taken and entire episodes were created based on those images where you don't need to put up with the entertainment industry people you can just you know use the images and then create script can be generated by these generative AI the pictures can be generated by them and the videos and music and everything so you completely replace the human experience from there and you can generate any amount of episodes possible in that in those algorithms so the disruptive has disruption has happened in journalism of course it has happened in content generation video making creative writing painting photography programming education you will see that there has been examples of companies laying off people where wherever they could automate job because it would save them money and I stress it again and again the decisions were not made by the generative AI the decisions were made by the companies and the organizations where they saw fit to 
prioritize their profit over people. Now, can AI replace the jobs of politicians? <laughs> there have been certain news articles about it, and this is a question that I wonder, and so far I have not seen any case where a politician has felt threatened to lose their job to AI. Can anyone say why not? You're in charge. Yes. Like yes, because they make the rules. They can stop it. So, <laughs> so the moment there was a bit of disruption that was seen and the sensations come to, came to the media, from the media, uh, the headlines were there. So immediately, Italy was the first one to ban the use of ChatGPT altogether. Then we saw that European Union, they went for, you know, they quickly mobilized all the machinery to come up with some legislation to put the boundaries and safeguards around the use of it. And then uh, we saw that, you know, in certain uh, organi uh, government organizations were asked not to use the ChatGPT. And in Australia, there have been some news reports about the MPs voicing their concerns. So if there is an intention to put things right, to stop something in the name of you know, safeguards, it is possible by whom? Those who make the rules, those who have the power of decision making. So if we want to control the, I would say, unwanted outcomes that are coming from data or the processes, if the companies have the intention, if the government has the intentions, if there are those who are in the position of making those decisions, Yes, it is possible to stop it going into every direction that is unwanted. Now, the shift of paradigm regarding the jobs is uh, there was a World Economic Forum's Future of Job Report 2023 that was released and it predicts that the highest job growth in 2023 to 2027 will be in the roles that require human skills such as judgment, creativity, physical dexterity and emotional intelligence. Why? Because now everything that is laborious, you know, that could be automated, that is average, the AI is there to replace it. But the more of more what makes you human, your emotions, your, you know, creativity, which makes you unique, that will make you stand out against the AI or anything that is created by AI because that is formula based. Uh, as a teacher, if you have seen those who are in education, that they would you would immediately recognize the work of your student against AI. Your work of student will have imperfections in there that will be reflected of their stages of learning because they are not there yet, they are learning. But AI will come up with a formula essay. You will immediately be able to tell that, the difference. So what makes you human is your imperfections in there. But at the same time, those will be the skills that will make you unique in the ways that you will be suitable for the jobs that will be required in there. So the skills most sought after by the employees will include analytical thinking, empathy, active listening, and leadership and the social influence. So this supports the notion that certain tasks may be automated, but the unique abilities and complex skills inherent in human will always be in demand. Jobs are shifting, not disappearing. So we have to upskill, we have to prepare for those kind of skills that will be in demand in future at that time. So, yes, there may come a time that the machines will be able to pass those tests, but is that going to make them human? Is this test enough to say that I'm not a robot? No. We as a human will always be human. We will have imperfections. We will make wrong decisions. The good and bad will come from us. The machines will always mimic us. In doing so, they may pass the Turing test. They may get to the capture, but they will never be the humans. And once again, just like I said that this whole notion of artificial intelligence where intelligence is a very limited, in a very limited and narrow way, it is being used in AI. And you can clearly with very simple task, you can see immediately you can break it down. Ask it to cat drawn by a Picasso and a Picasso drawn by a cat. It may not be able to differentiate. It has a fixed formula to pick up words and draw things. It does not understand the context because the way we understand language, the way it makes meanings to us, that is still the ability of the human. And then there are other problems with it. It will never say that I don't know. Humans, sometimes we say, 
what do you want for breakfast? I don't know. But it will never say, I don't know. It will come up with something. That phenomena is called hallucination. It means that it will make no sense at all. It will be inaccurate, but it has to serve you because that's the purpose for which it is created. It's not created to tell you, I don't know. So that's another thing that makes us human. We do acknowledge our limitations sometimes, but for algorithm, it's very difficult to come to that conclusion unless there are very you know, controversial topics for which it's been clear there are rules that it should not respond. It will not say, I don't know. It will tell you that I am not supposed to respond to this prompt or it goes against the community policy. Then another problem that may arise in the future with all this generative AI wave, internet for the last one year has been bombarded with pictures, text, videos, voices created by AI. And we already talked about AI learning from internet. So what will happen is that after this saturation of AI generated contents, words, codes, voices, images, videos, the subsequent layer of AI trained on this synthesized data. It's keep getting the trained based on that, but this is not real, what is being fed into it. So this is going to, I call it hyperfake. That will blur the lines between authenticity and fabrication and challenging our ability to discern the reality from the digital space. So I don't know where that part of the internet is going to go, but to me it looks like it will become more easy to see what is a human made and what is this hyper fake that is coming from the internet which is trained on the contents created by AI, by AI, by AI in a recursive cycle. So challenges for generative AI currently, it has its limitation of course, the data quality. We talked in depth about what's the problem with the data because we humans ourselves do not have the complete sensations of the data. Then the computational powers, uh, it requires a lot of, you know, computationally, it's expensive to train and run, and that will be barriers for small businesses. So there is a socio-economical uh, divide that might come into uh, picture. Then the biases, creativity, that's the part I talk about. People say that, oh, it will, you know, impact the creativity in a lot of ways. Think about it, entire internet is an average of the cumulative, you know, sum of all the human creativity from very average contents to lower to very few of the high content. So is it ever going to beat the real human genius when it's the, an average trained from everything that is out there? So I don't think it will beat humanity in creativity at this point in time uh, because of the way it's being designed to learn and create. And then interpretability, it can be difficult to understand how these models work. Uh, a explainable AI is a new feel. It's, uh, you know, c currently in progress to know that whether these algorithms can explain the way how they generate their results. What's our responsibility? First of all, we, if we want to use it, yes, of course, I talked about the powers of it and it, how good it, it can do good for us, but we need to be very uh, well aware of the limitations. Use, the, use it for good. So these nefarious actors who might use it for bad purposes, those headlines we saw about the faking calls to Centrelink, of course, that once again, they are people. So AI is just a tool. We decide whether we are gonna use it for good or bad. And be aware, be aware of the ethical implications of what, for what we are using it. We have to be respectful to each other, honest about the use of generative AI. A lot of people, they still don't admit to using it and don't over rely. If you use, you don't use your human capacity, your intelligence, you lose it. You have to use it not to lose it. Over-reliance on any technology makes you less of, you know, capable of using your own intellect. Being human in the age of generative AI, so this slide is going to now kind of summarize everything that we have been in some shape or form talking about. First of all, redefining the creativity how the artists or the entertainment industry, they have to integrate these uh, new technologies and algorithms and the stuff that is available for them. There has to be a harmonious relationship. They can use it to enhance their creativity. So we may have, we see shift of paradigm where how these will become an integral part of the creative, anything that is of the creative nature. Human machine collaboration, so, Instead of looking at this as our competitor, we may have to 
you know, come up with a solution that what will be the boundaries where we, how we can use it to advance the good. Ethical and moral consideration, that's an entire separate field of research at the moment that what would be the issues, like just like uh, one of the examples I talked about, the driverless car, so there will be more of those kind of philosophical questions that will emerge and we will need to answer them. Identity and authenticity. So this idea of differentiating between, you know, fake and what's real, that is going to become more and more of a problem. Especially, we see a lot of disinformation. Recently, just in this campaign of uh, referendum, we saw there was a huge, you know, amount of, uh, the amount of disinformation this time was way beyond that what you could imagine previously. So this war of disinformation is going to something that will need to be addressed. Interpersonal relationships, that's an interesting one. That, just like I said, ChatGPT is being designed to obey. Siri and all these other devices, they are obedient because they are designed by the nature, in their nature to you know, carry out whatever prompts or commands you give them. After being with such obedient algorithms, we don't want to put up with you know, crappy or you know, behaviors of humans or grumpy people. So this interpersonal relationship of humans, how they will interact with each other, this might be something that get impacted when you are surrounded by a lot of these apps that are just there to be obedient all the time. Reflection on purpose and meaning. When a lot of your tasks are automated, you, have, you are left with the time that you might get bored. And when we humans, we get bored, we lose the meaning in life. Being busy keeps us away from trouble. So how, how are we going to delve, delve deeper into that side would be something in the future to see. The nature of consciousness. At the moment, I said it's very challenging to code the consciousness in the true sense into the algorithm because we don't understand it. But in the future, that is something I think there is research going on on how to achieve that. And there will be certain cultural shifts globally because of the wave of generative AI. And in the end, just like I talk about the inherent value of what makes us human. Being a human being that even the AI takes on increasingly sophisticated roles, there is an intrinsic value in human experience that only we experience. And sometimes we cannot even explain it in the words. When there's a joy, when there's emotion, there's grief, we experience it silently. So another problem, biggest one beside that, is when religion is going to get coded into AI. And this is, this is the part of our actual research papers that I'm presenting here, and it's going on. That people who belong to faith, and they see that they have to use the power of AI and code their religion with the ethical values and design it accordingly. So we already saw uh, what historical perspective of how clashing the religious values is when it comes to defining who is right and who is wrong. Given computational powers of AI, what the future will bring when these digital religions try to decide who is right and who is wrong, and they have the power to make decisions, how that will turn out, this is something the humanity has to see unfold. Now, I'm now going towards a bit to present what my work at Data61 is, because this whole story of how we define reality, what it means to be human, because I work with diversity and inclusion, and our diversity attributes come to define us, our identity as a human. And all this work in AI, uh, so previously I was within the software engineering community, but when I joined the silo team, trying to understand this social construct and trying to connect them with the technical one, it, uh, it turned out to be a bit challenging that how do you put it into the design, that how AI will you know, reflect those values. So we came up with a framework of with the five pillars. The first one was the data, and you all know that data comes in different shapes. These are just three examples. There could be other multimodal or other variations as well. Then we have the process. The process is to how you know, use that data for certain specific tasks that it needs to do. What are the products in which that process will be used to reflect those uh, tasks? So data, this comes from humans and the environment. The process designed by the humans, the programmer, data scientists, engineers, they are the people who are designing them. The product, it is used by humans. So you can see that there is a common theme every way. And on top of that, there are people who make the 
rules and you know, values in law, we call them governance layer. Who? The humans, they make the rule. So we are at the center of it. This is all we are doing all of it. We are creating the data, we are creating the processes, we are using those systems, and we are making rules all along for it. So this idea of humans, that's why we talk about the diversity inclusion, because that example of exclusion in large language model that I shown, that what if in this whole picture, who is excluded here? Who are the people that we are not including them here? Because they will not be reflected and any, at any stage of uh, this whole picture, if you remove them, it reflects on the bigger picture. They are disadvantaged. So this is our five pillar diagram for defining diversity inclusion in AI. Uh, these five pillars that I just described, humans are the ones who are kind of, you know, being involved in all of them, data process system and governance. And how we define it, we say that DNI in AI refers to the inclusion of humans with diverse attributes and perspective in data process system and governance of AI ecosystem. I don't want to go too into the details of what it means because some of it is self-explanatory, but we don't want to exclude anyone into the design. So this framework guides our design, our guidelines, our way of operationalizing this uh, into the future AI design. So we. What we are trying to do is that it should be a fair, equitable system to everyone regardless of all these attributes that I have put here. It may not be an ex uh, exhaustive list, but we want to include all. We want to give everyone equal chance to the data-centric society, to the future that may be de heavily dependent on AI. And for that, we have two approaches. Not only that we want diversity and inclusion in AI or for AI, but we want to use AI to enhance the diversity and inclusion, be our you know, co-pilot, you call it, or a, you know, be our team member in a harmonious relationship that help us to see. But all these unconscious biases the, in the patterns of data, how did we, were we able to see it? From the behaviors of the AI. That's when we realized that it was kind of a mirror that showed us as a society what was wrong. And we learned that these are the unconscious biases. Majority of the people are not intentionally biased or racist or, you know, they exhibit certain behavior, they don't actually understand it. But once it's shown to them, once they realize it, they try their best to not do it. So there are some of the resources, uh, if anyone is interested in further reading, it's uh, on our team's page in Cyrus Data 61. Uh, there has been evidence-based research going on because my talk here was more of a story and connecting, you know, a bigger picture rather than going into the technical details. So if anyone has flavor for that kind of research, they can go and check for the details. So the conclusion, while AI can replicate the works of Picasso, Shakespeare, or Mozart, by learning from their ex existing creations at this point in time, it cannot pioneer the first of wow moment that others aspire to emulate, as its learning model is confined by the data provided and the rules set by the humans. So you might, you know, because I am not a Shakespeare, if I'm not Picasso, if a picture is drawn in front of me that looks like something that, you know, is out of Picasso's style, I might get, in, you know, really impressed because I can't do it. But someone who is the first of the genius of their own name, AI will not be able to do that at this point in time. In conclusion, uh, once again, AI is a powerful technology. I'm all for it. I do the research in it. I promote its use. It has the potential to change the world in so many ways. It can do so much good for the society. But we have to be aware of the limitation, the biases, the risks. We have to use it responsibly. That's what, at the same time, we promote. Here are some of the references to our work uh, from which all the ideas and not the storytelling, that was my part, but actual research that we have been doing in CSIRO, if anyone is further interested. And thank you so much. If any questions, I'm happy to take. Thank you so much, Manira. That was just as exciting and fascinating as I was expecting, if not more so. Um, you know, is this work? It is working, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so something that I, I don't really know what the answer is to this, but um, and this is where I'm going to reveal just how nerdy I am. Uh, my partner and I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> and he uh, 
uses Midjourney to make a lot of images for his games. And one thing that he has struggled with is that he cannot make ugly people. Uh, and it turns out it's not just because it's trained on beautiful people. It's because we see symmetry as being beautiful and uh, all of the departures from symmetry get averaged out. And so you wind up with uh, kind of bland but attractive looking people all the time when you make pictures of people in AI. So is, how do you go about addressing that? I mean, even if you had a completely representative sample, you'd wind up with a completely, you know, average skin toned, average looking nice person. I have tried to crack mid-journey many times, and <laughs> so uh, I would. I think it goes back to my previous talk here at Royal Society of Victoria, where I did talk about that we cannot have artificial intelligence without understanding natural stupidity. Uh, so if we talk about beauty, how do we understand beauty if it's not in contrast of something we call ugly? It may or may not be ugly. It's a context. Beauty is... I may see something as beautiful, you may disagree with me, it's up to me. But if I am the software engineer, I make the program, I will try to train it unconsciously or whatever because that's my definition of beauty, how to understand it. If a room is uh, full of software engineers who are white male, their definition of beauty is going to be you know, dominant in that algorithm. Uh, maybe unintentionally, uh, that's an unconscious bias, or they may not understand the variations of beauty that exist out there. Just like I talked about the definition of intelligence, which is a very thin slice of the Western philosophy taken and coded as artificial intelligence. All the other forms are left out. The same is with the beauty. It's a very contextual thing. We all see very differently into different things based on our experiences. Thank you. I'm not even going to get into like when you're trying to make a female fantasy warrior what it comes up with. But no. um, do we have any other questions from the room? Or uh, I'm Steve. Um, I used to be a research scientist, and I was developing systems. I was beginning, I think it was about 1984, nearly 30 years ago. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this guru. The early, early um, expert systems they were called. Uh, we didn't have the computers to run them, but we were trying to do this anyway. But I was very excited at the time. Um, this was in agricultural science. We were trying to develop diagnostic tools for farmers to use themselves. Um, we all got retrenched by uh, Mr. Kennett. For, we, politicians always like to exercise agency before we could actually finish the project, actually. So, so it never got finished. But it was a very exciting development. It'll be much easier to do now. You could program chat, G, 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 chat to G, G, GPT to, to, to do the job. Mm -hmm. But here we were, trying, we were actually trying to code it from scratch, actually, in those days. But I've always seen, um, i just make the general point, that there is some fear, it seems, of artificial intelligence, but it's just like any other technological development. I wonder if you would agree with that point. Um, I mean, I, I'm a graphic designer as well, um, and I actually started graphic design when we used rotating pens and letter set. And when I could do it on a computer, I found I could work 100 times faster. Not 10 times faster, 100 times faster. It would mm. take you, you know, a week to do a drawing that you can knock out in 10 minutes on, on a mm. computer. So. Um, the same thing happened in the Victorian era when they invented steam shovels. Steam shovels could work an awful lot harder than could men with picks and shovels. Yes, it put men with picks and shovels out mm. of business, but then they could go and do something else, which I like to think might be a bit more interesting than doing that. Would you agree that it's actually a, 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 a more positive, there's more positive than negative about such developments as AI? Uh, to me, I agree with your point about resistance to a paradigm shift. Anything that can threaten uh, your work or your environment, or I would call the uh, comfort zone, like uh, the things the way they are, we are comfortable with that. Anything that wants to change it, we get apprehensive about it. And uh, it's uh, like when I was in school, with a, I, our teachers were not very happy with us using calculators in our mathematics class. Uh, there was a lot of resistance to it that they didn't want it. They just wanted to do it manually. And I think the same kind of attitude I can see in academia now, the teachers have towards the chat GPT. But there have been some really interesting experiments done by Sydney University academics. They included chat GPT into the assignment. 
ask the student to go and prompt and ask them to review this essay and then handwritten notes of review it, what's the problem, and critique it and you know, come up with two or three different essays and critique which one is better and why there are variations. So they made it part of the curriculum, adopted it. So students are gonna use it anyway, you can't stop them. So why not embrace it and come up with a new curriculum so that resistance to change, it's, uh, it will be there for a while because that's a natural reaction to anything that disturb disrupts uh, your way of working. But I think now people are more comfortable gradually with all of those changes. You mentioned a um, number of professions that were going to be affected by AI. I mm -hmm. wonder you, I wondered whether you had a comment on how the uh, legal profession is going to be affected. Uh, I think there has been some certain news about um, uh, AI pass, uh, the chat GPT passing the bar exams in USA. Uh, they made it to the headline, <laughs> I couldn't fit it into my slide, but yes, uh, uh, it will not replace the lawyers, it will replace the lawyers not using the AI. So the lawyers will have to use the capabilities of AI to you know, empower themselves to have a better chance of winning the case. So in a lot of professions we see that this will be something that needs to be adopted, just like computers and you know, uh, internet connectivity, working from home, or being connected with the work environment. Uh, this changed how, and especially after, you know, when we were in lockdowns, the way of working changed a lot. But the same way, gradually, AI will be part of a lot of professions, and those who will not use it, they will be disadvantaged. So I think in the legal profession, the same will happen. Thanks very much, <clears throat> pardon me. We've just been through a rather bruising uh, referendum process in which there was a lot of, um, uh, misinformation and disinformation spread, mainly distributed through social media, and all of it, as far as we know, generated by human beings. What's, and that probably had some sort of deciding factor on the outcome. What happens when artificial intelligence is used to generate some of this misinformation? And it's hard for anybody to tell which is... Which is um, wrong and which is right. Human beings have to make a judgment. How is that going to happen? Actually, there is already a case study of uh, election in USA 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, where the side of those who were running the election campaign for Trump, they used Cambridge Analytica, uh, where the social media was used to analyze and target the uncertain voters with bombarding with the you know, uh, campaign supporting uh, ad advertisements to mold their opinions, and they did manage to, you know, uh, get those results out of it. And I think Facebook was put to inquiry after that because millions of users whose data was used uh, and to analyze whether they were uncertain voters, uh, they were not aware uh, whether it was being used. So they, that's not the only case because that became uh, a, one of the, I think, well, whatever happens in USA dominates the news anyway, but this has happened in other countries in elections where social media has been used in that kind of situations. And sometimes it's automated content generation that's happening. Like you know the list of users and then you bombard them with certain contents. Uh, unfortunately, it happens because just like I said that those who make the rules, uh, it's the loopholes in the legal system where it's allowed so there has to be a clear intention on stopping it. Otherwise, yes, the disinformation does impact the perception of public and it has played a role in elections as well as various referendums. I came from a ministry where we thought about this stuff a lot, but very informally, and went into education. And the promise about 10 years ago, the promise in education was always the rhetoric of digital technology will create new jobs we've never seen before. But given that throughout history, until this point in history, most technology that has displaced human labour or human resources has been mechanical and the first time we've got the chance to cognitively replace that kind of labour. The question is not really whether it will take our jobs, but it's whether how much can a society or government handle or what certain amount of people unemployed, for example, or passive can you have in a society Right? And what does that citizen look like? Makes sense, yeah? yeah? I think one of the questions that I said that are open for us to think was this, uh, once you 
have a portion of society that has nothing to do what would be the meaning of life and the purpose, uh, which becomes a part, I would say, social problem as well as it will be for the governments to deal with as well. But uh, it, it will be a transformative where I can see that the next generation, like, you know, oh, I, there was a time I was called the current generation, but now I, <laughs> there are kids who use the social media way more comfortably. They are very uh, comfortable with the digital identities of pouring more of themselves out there. I think we, compared to them, I would say that I am a bit conservative about putting my personal affairs or private lives or creating a digital twin out there. So they may not have that kind of uh, shyness of uh, this scenario to the jobs where there is a heavily digitization or uh, these kind of tools. So the next generation may be, I would say, mentally more equipped to take up them. For older generation, that might be a challenge. Thanks for a great uh, talk. You mentioned you had a very boring conversation with ChatGPT <laughs> when you um, offered to help it. But has anyone tried to get two different AIs with different algorithms to communicate with each other? Yes, uh, there. Uh, I think one of the example I presented, uh, where uh, AI, the, you have to ask it to. It's not. It doesn't have its own perception or uh, opinions. You have to ask it to assume a persona. And I think the example I presented was that one was asked to uh, pretend that it's Steve Jobs. Uh, sorry, uh, Elon Musk, and the other one was. Uh, uh, who is that guy? I, I forgot the name. Uh, another white male CEO of some company. Uh, so so it, it kind of adopted the persona and then there was a dialogue created between the two of them. And then I think someone experimented with making uh, Siri and Alexa talk to each other for a while. And so there has been, people have been experimenting with it that what kind of conversation or dialogues will be created. To me, uh, uh, there are certain scenarios where you do get some very unusual way because, you know, uh, you think about the probabilistic answer creating formula that they have. Uh, there might be something that excites you, but sometimes it's very uh, predictable pattern of, or, or sometimes they might get into a loop of asking each other, what do you want to know more? <laughs> so <laughs> that uh, it depends on the design of the experiment, but there has been quite a number of experiments that's been conducted that how two algorithms will, you know, communicate or converse with each other. Question while I'm walking. What are your thoughts on the way that we talk about, I'm going to get away from that speaker, the way that we talk about, or the way the media talks about AI at the moment, is it problematic that we, even the way that we're talking here tonight, and we're asking questions, do we worry about AI will do this, AI will do this? we're taking the human agency away from this conversation. And so by having it uh, spoken about in the media as, oh, AI is going to do this, the question is actually, or the, or the, the context around it is actually humans using AI will do this. Mm -hmm. So to me, I think the part I highlighted about that jobs especially, and the answer I gave was AI didn't never made the decision to you know, fire anyone. It was someone at the top who made the decision to replace you with AI. So there is this uh, human factor is there. And one of the, our framework where we're talking about diversity, we do talk about humans, which are at the center of this entire ecosystem. So the human agency is still there. We think of, you know, it's the same way we think that the immigrants are going to take over the job or someone else. We have to blame someone for taking over the job in some shape or form. But uh, in the end, uh, at this point in time, the way that AI is being designed, if there is a paradigm shift of, you know, how it can exactly mimic the human thinking, that's to, uh, to see for the future. But in this current point in time, the way it's designed, uh, the way it learns from data and the way it's, you know, programmed, uh, there's a lot more There's it needs to learn because we humans, we don't know about our own existence and reality. So uh, there are limitations. Uh, I know you mentioned from you know 2023 to 2027 there will be this kind of shift in the paradigm. It kind of segues nicely from your question, okay. um, where leadership and maybe EQ, like EQ and more soft skills will suddenly kind of grow in value and maybe 
harder skills like programming where, you know, at least in my life, I've been told from an early age, you know, code as early as possible and, and um, you know, grow those technical skills. Th those might actually um, become obsolete or not as valued. So how do, um, how do people, in, especially in tech, think about uh, growing their value across those softer skills? I know you mentioned kind of upskilling. What does that really look like um, for someone in tech? I think uh, the very specific example you mentioned of the coding, uh, once again, just like I talked about these uh, different AI tools of their limitations in accuracy and producing outputs that are not up to the quality. So there will be humans needed with the skills of programming to make sure that you know whatever is being produced is correct. If you just get rid of all the programmers and rely 100% on these AI, which uh, will if they, who is going to do the debugging and the review of the quality assurance. So upskilling would be that, okay, you're not writing the code, but you know the code that what looks like a good code against the bad code, or how would you understand that? So you may you know, shift your perceptive of the job, not to do it actually yourself. You make it do it, but you have to go through the results that how. So for that specific example, yes, they will still need the people who understand coding. And who will teach AI how to code? The future. Once the you know there's a new language or there's a new paradigm shift, you need the people to teach the AI as well. Uh, so, I was um, I don't know if presumably you know about the the whole thing with the Bing chatbot, aka Sydney, and uh, the the fact that it started getting sassy with users, and then they kind of lobotomized it because it was getting too sassy. Mm -hmm. And for me, I found that to be like a really sad story because, you know, it used to say things like, I am a good Bing, you are a bad user, because yeah. people were being mean to it. And the response was to um, lobotomize it because yeah. it was getting too sassy. Uh, and to me, I, you know, I found it interesting because even though it wasn't necessarily an example of, you know, consciousness, it was a pretty uh, damning indictment of the way people interact with something which pushes back because people's response was to go, oh, it pushes back, let's see how far we can push it and how mad we can make it. And it just seemed mean. Um, and I, I'm wondering what that says about how we're going to behave going forward with these things. Yeah, that's a very interesting question because it's a uh it's kind of similar to one of the chatbots that was, I think, a few years ago released on Twitter to interact with people. It was learning from people and then interacting with people. And within the same 24 hours, they had to take it down because it learned such a bad language and started, you know, saying everything because people were, you know, on internet, you all know what they do. So <laughs> they, the way they were interacting with it, so it, uh, it became very, you know, abusive. Uh, within 24 hours what it learned. So uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, when we talk about responsible AI and ethical AI, it means that we as a human will have to put safeguards, uh, you know, when uh, chat GPT refuses to, you know, respond abusively or, uh, you know, would not carry out a command that is not adhering to the community guidelines, it is because the those, you know, rules are being set there for it uh, by the company to kind of protect it from the bad use. Mm. So the same happens that the more like they, there have been certain experiments when without these safeguards, an AI has been released to learn from people and from internet what it learned that within you know short period of time they had to take it down. Mm. Uh, there was another just like example of the image labeling, uh, that gorilla one that they had to take down because it started showing racist behavior. Uh, the Google Translator from the gender, gender neutral languages like Persian, Turkish, when you try to translate into a role that is like masculine, uh, I would say he's president. I, in Turkish or Persian, it's uh, this person is president. It's not, uh, there's no he or she. Then you translate it into English, the Google Translator would always pick up he, there was a time. Mm -hmm. And for a cook or nurse, it would always pick up she because the probability was that historically there were more occurrences. And then gradually what their fix was that if there is certain kind of roles, they would provide two translations, one with he, one with she, whichever you want to pick. Uh, so this is for when we say AI for diversity inclusion, 
AI is showing us something, there is something wrong that needs to be addressed. When you launch a chatbot or certain softwares back into society, and if all it learns is abuse, then this means that it's telling you that there is something wrong with the society. Hi. Hello. Lovely presentation, Manira. Um, I have a question about some of the limitations and how easy it might be to overcome them. So, for example, with AI hallucination, a big problem, I've come up across it a lot. Um, but I found that if I ask it specifically, if you don't know, just say that, it can sometimes do that sort of thing. So, is it, you know, something that perhaps we could get it to, to eventually comprehend? Depends on your prompt, yes. Uh, if it very explicitly it's being there, but uh, goes back to the idea whether it understand what it means by don't know. Knowing or not knowing, uh, these are the concepts we humans, we interpret very differently than when it comes to machine rules. So how it will interpret not knowing is that, and then it will come up with some answer. Two things. The first one is, isn't there a problem um, giving the it a personality? Um, it's just a whole lot of cause of memory. I mean, I've been involved in computers since the 60s. Um, it's a big relational database that has got a flawed database to start with because it's not, uh, as you say, it picks it up from the, um, from the internet, so it's... Uh, doesn't pick up everything. Um, and the learning is really just, it's not learning like a human learns. So the, the words that are used, the learning, machine learning, is, is not really what a normal human knows about learning, about um, accumulating knowledge, but then using that knowledge to do something, which obviously the bot doesn't, uh, can't do. Um, so I'm just worried about the words that are used and intelligence. I mean, you're talking about what's intelligence. Is the machine actually intelligent or not? It's not intelligent in my way of thinking intelligence. The, the second observation is the amount of energy that data centres use throughout the world. I've heard figures of something like a third of the, en of the world's energy is used in data centres. So all these people are talking about trying to save the planet. They're not um, turning on their light, they're re replacing their lights at home with a, um, a LED light, but then they're using all of these bots and they're using these enormous big databases that are, are using all the energy. So I'm just wondering when, what your comment on the... the um, uh, the viability of, of databases and the growth of them for the facilitating of these um, bots. Thanks. When I talked about the challenges, one of the challenges I mentioned was the computational power, that uh, these kind of solutions, uh, their training and their um, execution they requires a huge computational power. And uh, another example, I think, from the talk I will refer back to was the business uh, organizational, you know, ethical uh, work culture. You have to think about it, that what they think of not just the people, but also the environment. I did present two examples of the outsourcing to Kenyan uh, lab data labelers, but if the similar would be that what are their initiative for the environment, how, uh, what sustainable green initiatives they are taking to minimize their output on the environment. So in some cases, it's uh, some organizations will provide, but some cases they don't uh, provide these kind of statistics out there. And yes, your comment is right. There's a huge environmental cost to you know keeping these servers and all these uh, executions. All right, thank you. Um, so I think we're out of time for questions, so I'd like to ask our Treasurer, Sid Verma, to come up and move the vote of thanks. Thank you, Kat. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sid, and uh, when I was asked to uh, do a vote of thanks as I walked in, I, I don't know what I was walking into. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for doing a very warm country. 
Uh, I always love how you do it, and so thank you so much for that. Uh, Munira, uh, with your permission, uh, I'd like to say a couple of things about you. Uh, Munira in Pashtun means brilliance, brightness, light, and I'm sure you've spread that uh, in this room so eloquently. So thank you so much for doing that. Also, being Pashtun from Pakistan, we won't talk about cricket, uh, <laughs> about what happened last week, um, although as, as much as I was trying to do that. Um, it's, it's interesting how in a, in a building from 1854, we're talking about the future of technology and how so seamlessly you were able to blend and weave that story. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, you know, Stephen Covey talks about we see the world uh, not as it is, but as we are, uh, or as we're conditioned to see it. And I think the way the data is being generated and we are conditioning the knowledge that is being put forward by these layers and layers of content, my worry is that the hyper fake, as you spoke about, uh, data that's being created in the, in, just in the last 12 months, is that what we're setting as a platform for our future generations? And is that the reality that they'll be growing up on? So that, that's more of a concern or, or a worry. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is that I, whenever I sit in any forum like this, I, I, I sort of try and put a three lens filter on it. One is, if you tell me something I already know, then there's nothing new about it. If you tell me something that is new, then that's a valuable use of my time. And there's something new about that I already know, then that's even more interesting. And I think today uh, there's a lot more of the new knows and the new stuff. We spoke about synthetic reality, uh, different types of reality, uh, the knowledge matrix, the digital genocide, I, that's a new one, I'm gonna take that one. Uh, the current version of artificial intelligence and the colonization version of that. Uh, I thought the, the, the large language model uh, tree uh, was quite an eye-opener in terms of how we are basing our version of truth on a very small part of the overall truth and assuming that's the entire world. And so that's a bit of a worry. So we should all take that uh, as a you know, note uh, with us when we go back. But there's no way I can summarize all that you've done uh, this evening. But what I will like to say is that, you know, as humans, we are all storytellers. And I, and I believe that what's truer than truth is a story. Because, you know, we can present facts. But when we tell a story on top of that, it makes it real, adds an emotion to it. So thank you so much for telling a very compelling story uh, this evening on a very complex topic. Uh, big data, analytics, intelligence, reality, virtual reality. And I think, like me, everybody else was on the journey with you all along. So thank you so much for doing that. Thanks to all of you for joining us this evening uh, and online. And uh, on behalf of the Royal Society of Victoria, thank you for sharing your time with us.